So, yeah, as usual, I was a bit slower than I thought. So what I want to do now is to finish discussing the topic of higher order corrections and then move to discuss uh, JETS and TLC. So I showed you some results for the real and fixed production. And I mentioned that these were some of the first calculations that were done because they were also very relevant. Relian can be measured very precisely. Higgs, of course, was the, one of the interesting things at TLC. Now, and this so what I'm showing here now is a timeline of our calculations that have been done. So you see how Drelian and Higgs were computed in the years 2002-2004, and then for a long time, really not very much, much changed. So this process is, for instance, associated Higgs production. If you think about it, it's really like Drelian, where the W say is option and then it's a Higgs. But on the QCD point of view, it's really like Drelian. And now, really, in the very recent years, a lot of things happened in the sense that many more processes have been computed. So now I would say the status of this calculation is that everything that is a two to two scattering can be computed the next next to the living world. But uh, things that, the, so the frontier now is to go into two to three processes. In that case, at the moment, we have essentially only one calculation, which is the calculation of PP bar to three photons. So you immediately understand three photons is the simplest calculation you can do. Everybody is massless. There is no QCD in the final state. But it's, of course, the first step in this. Now, when you have so many calculations, as shown here, what you can do is also see how well the scale uncertainties actually work in different cases. So this is summarized nicely here. So you, what you see here are different processes, Dryan, Higgs, Diphoton, Gamma Gamma, Z Gamma, and so on. The uncertainty that you get from scale variation at next to living order, and the same uncertainty that you get at next to next to living order. So one sees that essentially next to next to living order, these uncertainties now are typically of the order of a few percent. But of course, the question is is this really the fear uncertainty or not? Or is this um, not conservative enough? In particular, you see that in many cases, the uncertainty at next to living order did not really work out so nicely. There was a big jump and so on. So these are issues that people are discussing, of course, uh, a lot now. And now I just would like to flash a few results to see what the benefit is when you do this calculation. So this is, again, one example where you can, for instance, look at the cross-section of uh, WZ, a diboson production process, at different energies, now different um, measurements. And you see the ratio, uh, the comparison of data to NLO and next to next to living order. So in general, one sees an improvement here in the description of data, as I mentioned already before. Similarly, these were somehow first calculations done for, this is for instance, X plus one jet production. So like X production, but with uh, additional radiation. And, um, so again, uh, I mean, what, what do you see here? In general, one sees uh, corrections tend to be positive, uh, tend to, uh, for inclusive uh, cross-sections, uh, tend to reduce the uncertainty band, go in the right direction to describe data. But in these cases, for instance, you see that the, the uncertainties on data are still really much larger. So in this case, one cannot say very much, but of course, data will improve a lot. This is another example I would like to show. So here, this is uh, the cross-section for the Rayan, but where you go to very large PT. And so here, to have a really next to next to leading order calculation, you must have a calculation of uh, Z plus Z. And again, here we see the comparison of data to theory predictions. And this is a case where you see that this uh, agreement is not so nice. And this was one of the examples uh, I was mentioning when you do PDF fits, uh, what do you do in the case of such data? How can you include them in fits uh, if uh, you don't get a very nice uh, theoretical description? Here, one should say, for instance, uh, that if you look at normalized distribution as shown to the right, the agreement is really much, much better. And so these errors also have an overall luminosity uncertainty that is not uh, here. But somehow, what I want to say is that this comparison can become very subtle. This is another example of uh, next to next. Again, what do you see? Again, huge band at leading order, or huge. In this case, it's not even huge. It looks huge on this scale, but 10% uh, uncertainty at leading order. 
you reduce the uncertainty when you go to NLO, this light blue. But then when you go to next to next, which is the red, you see that uh, there is no real agreement between uh, the two bands. So the next to next in this case is not inside the NLO band. There are also, so the screen points, uh, this is a different approximation and so on. So in essence, it's not always easy to get a completely consistent picture here. But, um, and this uh, is the example I also mentioned, which is uh, the last next to next reading order result I want to flash. This is in fact this calculation of PP bar to diphotons. So for this calculation, you really need uh, what, uh, what is called pentagons. Uh, no? So you have, uh, kind of uh, pentagons. So you have PP, photon, 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 but then you have this two loop, uh, two loop integrals here. So you really see you need this uh, five point two loop functions, uh, right? Uh, and this is the first, uh, this is really the first uh, two to three application at next to next to reading room. And in this case, uh, what one sees here is really, again, a relatively a big jump uh, from NLO to next to next, uh, and they really improved description of data in this case. Okay, and so what, what this, for instance, shows is also how big these effects are when you go to very high energies, as is relevant if you study, for instance, FCC and so on. So this is uh, all I wanted to say in terms of uh, next to next to reading world. Huh? And uh, then, okay, the frontier, okay, on one side, uh, one frontier is now computing two to three at next to next to reading order. The other is, of course, uh, pushing the accuracy even further, going to N3 LO and cube LO. Yeah. So here, this has been done, for instance, in the case of Higgs production, inclusive Higgs production, or even in the case of Trendiana recently. But of course, these calculations are really super, super hard. Why is it difficult? In essence, because you see what, what you see here, these are three loop integrals. Huh? So integrals where you integrate over three loops, uh, these are four dimensional loops, so really very complicated integral. And you really also have a lot of them. So if you write down these diagrams, at your end, you get the order of 10 to the five interference diagrams that you have to have. In terms of loop integrals, it's really many millions, about 60 millions of loop diagrams. And when you reduce everything to the simplest building blocks that you have, what, what you call the master integrals, you have about thousands of them. So this calculation is really very complicated. But this is the first, in the case of Higgs production, is the first calculation that has been done. So the process we're talking about, again, is this Higgs in the large and top approximation, right? So this is the leading order, and then you have these three loops on top of this here. Okay. Now I want to show you some results here as well. This is now the total cross-section as you get it, as a function of this uh, renormalization factorization scheme. Okay. So again, this uh, some leading order next to leading and next to next we have already seen. The new result here is this red one here. And now you see somehow how this red curve is really incredibly flat, really very, very remarkably flat. Of course, if you go to extremely low, extremely high scales, you know that the result will diverge. But there is really this huge plateau, meaning it does not matter anymore to some extent which scale you choose, because the dependence is really very, very small. Notice that somehow these rectangles here, are the uncertainties that you get a given order when you change the scale by a factor of two only. So this is how the envelope on this point from here. No? This effect of two with respect to this reference scale. So in the case of Higgs production, in fact, rather than choosing an Higgs, there have been a lot of discussion and so on, but now there is a consensus that the better scale is in fact an Higgs over two. And this is some of what is used as a reference scale in many of these plots. Now, I just want to show you now the comparison with data in this case. So for the total Higgs cross-section, so these are data, the points, and the, the blue is the theory prediction. 
So when what you see out of this uh, plot is that somehow the, the theory predictions are much, much more precise at the moment than um, the measurements. But of course, the experimental uncertainty is with the case. Yeah? But what one also sees, I mean, these uh, crosses that I put on this plot are what you would have as a prediction if you wouldn't compute higher order terms. Right? So somehow, if you would not compute higher order terms, you would say that uh, theoretical predictions are even, uh, despite the really big experimental errors, that they are not really very compatible. So you would uh, maybe even say that you have uh, new physics in the heat sector. So somehow computing this in this case is really essential. Okay. So another calculation that has been done uh, is uh, this one, uh, which is uh, uh, vector boson fusion Higgs production. So vector boson fusion Higgs production is shown here, I already mentioned it. That, uh, so you produce a Higgs boson by fusing two vector bosons here. And in essence, uh, this process uh, can be thought of uh, two copies of deep elastic scattering. Uh, that's why somehow one can compute this to very high precision. This is what enters this calculation. And in this case, what you see is, a, in this case, again, a remarkable, uh, extremely small uncertainty band when you go to N3 and O. And how this, uh, you see that this red band is completely within the green band. So this really gives confidence that at this point, you really have reached extremely high precision for this. Now, the last plots I want to show are, again, very recent plots now. This is uh, for W production, W plus. This is for Z production, yeah, Z production here. This type of plots where you look at, for instance, the ratio of the cross-section over your N3 and your result. And again, then one can discuss for a long time what is the better scale choice, what is really the uncertainty that you have given this. In particular, you see, in this case, these bands don't really overlap nicely in some regions and so on. So there are all these kind of issues that uh, are very important to understand and interpret. So I think these are the last plots I wanted to show in terms of results like that. And uh, so I want to close this chapter of higher order corrections. So in essence, the takeaway message is at leading order, we can compute everything in an automated way. And next to leading order also, the edge is uh, something with four or five particles in the final state. It depends a bit on the complexity. Next to next, uh, everything that is a two to two scattering can be done. Two to three is this kind of new frontier. And in Q below, we have really only very few calculations. Higgs, Drelian, vector boson fusion, because you think about it as twice deep elastic scattering. On the other hand, it's also true that in some cases, it's also clear that you need to put, uh, push the perturbative accuracy so much higher. It depends on what other uncertainties you have, of course. Uh, so sometimes to have something that uh, the, where the perturbative accuracy is at the per mil level, like this one, uh, at the LHC might not be needed because you have other uncertainties that are larger. But so, but this is roughly the status. Now, because I, talked a lot about calculations. I also want to show a few examples where you use this calculation and you can do some physics. So one that I just want to mention really is the measurement of the W mass. Measurement of the W mass is, I believe, one of the most remarkable measurements done at LHC. The measurements you find it see here, the mass is measured to 19 MeV precision. So this is 0.2 per mil precision relative accuracy. And this is something that I think people would have never thought that this is possible. In particular, this is a very difficult measurement because as you know very well, the W alpha decays to quarks, uh, which is overwhelmed by QCD backgrounds and so on, or it decays to W and neutrino. So you cannot reconstruct an invariant mass peak. You have to study a distribution like this one, this transverse mass, um, which is, uh, you measure some of the PT of the lap, the missing momentum, and uh, this takes into account the angle between these two. Right? So from such an observable, if you want to extract the W mass, this is of course sensitive to the W mass, but if you want to extract it to this precision, you really have to have a, a theoretical control on this prediction. That is really, so it's a very, very, I think, impressive, challenging, the most, I think, challenging 
measurement that has been done. But I also want to discuss other applications, so other new things that one could do with a loop calculations. And one has to do with the measurement of the coupling of the Higgs to light quarks, in particular the Higgs to charm. If you look at the coupling of Higgs to charm, so you have a coupling here. This can, of course, be measured in, um, has been measured, but as you see from the plots here, it really has a large uncertainty. It has a large uncertainty because, uh, well, because the, the value of the coupling is so small that it's very difficult to constrain it. So, for in, so different methods have been suggested, for instance, to look at associated Higgs plus charm production, or to look at the rare decays of the Higgs boson, which decays of something that contains a charm, or even to look at Higgs, associated Higgs production, where the Higgs goes to MDB bar. And then you always have a, a charm mistaking. So in essence, if uh, uh, the Higgs to charm coupling would be very large, it would affect Higgs to BB bar simply because sometimes you mistake a charm for a beam. And so this, these are the constraints, this is this VH recast here that you have. But you see that despite this constraints and uncertainty here, the spans are really very large. So one recent idea that was suggested has to do with using loop effects. So now exploiting these loop calculations. And in particular, what you can do here is exploit the fact that, so we saw that the main Higgs production mechanism is Higgs to top of this. Yeah? But of course, there is also a contribution where you have charm quartz in the loop. And so the dominant effect that involves the charm is in fact this interference of top and charm, this one here. Now interference between this type of amplitudes typically change the shapes of your distributions. So it's not like adding a second copy of the top that would change the normalization, but it's kind of gives an interference effect and the shape, change in shape. And this change in shape is shown here. And what is interesting about this measurement is that the biggest effect that you have is close to where you have the most of the Higgs bosons. The Higgs bosons tend to be light, low PT, so there you really have a lot of events. So it's a measurement that over time can release, uh, looks really very promising. Of course, it's a bit what we say, it's an indirect measurement because you, the charm is in the loop really, so it's an indirect effect that you see. Okay, so, and so the last example maybe I want to mention has to do with uh, the Higgs potential. Probably Ricardo talked a lot about this uh, or not, but, um, we know that the Higgs potential in the standard model after, sorry, after symmetry breaking, you have a term in the Higgs potential in the standard model. We have a term that is quadratic. A term that is involves the Higgs field to the power three and the quartic term. This can be written in this form. So this quadratic term, you somehow probe or measure when you measure the Higgs mass. So when you do single Higgs production, measure the mass, you somehow probe this term. To measure this type of term, so the coupling of the Higgs boson to itself is lambda, you typically have to do double Higgs production. So at the LHC, you have to produce one Higgs that decays into two Higgs bosons. And there you become sensitive to this lambda. Now, the problem is that this measurement is very difficult. Why? On one side, because each Higgs goes on decays. The largest decay of the Higgs is to B quarks, but this is difficult because you have also gluons that give rise to B quarks. Or you can look at electronic decays, but then the cross section is smaller. And uh, on top of this, the cross section just to produce two Higgs boson, at the end, because of some interference effects that are destructive, is relatively small. So, in essence, here for a single Higgs, we have something, the cross section is about 45 picobarn. 
And here we're talking about 45 femtograms. So it's a factor of 1,000 smaller. And you have these additional complications that the final set is more difficult. Still, this measurement can be done. So in essence, one can look at the invariant mass of, uh, as an observable, uh, typically one looks at the invariant mass of the two Higgs bosons and uh, tries to constrain lambda from there. And the constraint that we have today is about, uh, so let me write it, lambda over lambda standard model is about a factor 10. Right. So it can vary by roughly a factor 10 up and down. So it's still a really very large and constraint. And um, instead, a new idea that was suggested uh, is that you can become sensitive to lambda also if you do single Higgs production, right? So suppose that, for instance, you're doing a um, no, vector boson fusion. How can you become sensitive to lambda here? Well, you simply have a loop like this, uh, which involves a Higgs boson in the loop. So through this type of uh, one loop corrections, in this case, you become sensitive to it. And you see this appears generally, you could do, you could be looking at VH production. And also here you have this type of uh, diagrams. The same is for TP by Higgs and so on. So you have a whole range of uh, measurements that you can do that are sensitive to lambda. The sensitivity is small because it's loop induced, but uh, as opposed to double Higgs production, where essentially the only observable is the, the Higgs invariant mass of the system, here you can really measure many processes, many observables, and do a sort of global fit. And so this plot shows this, how this uh, at the moment was also suggested first theoretically here on this plot here. In essence, what you can do is uh, see how much you can constrain. Uh, mm, well, maybe let's, uh, let me not get into details, but this can, uh, can then be somehow implemented in experimental analysis. And this is somehow shown here, the constraints that you have on kappa lambda. You see that at the moment they are comparable to the one that you have from, from single Higgs production. Now, both measurements will improve in different ways. They will benefit of uh, experimental improvement in really different ways. Okay, so, okay, I hope uh, I convince you that, okay, people do these calculations, they do them to achieve precision and so on, but also this calculation do open up some new opportunities, uh, do new things that you could not do if you wouldn't have uh, loop effects. Um, okay, so the, I don't know if there are questions so far. Huh? Otherwise, I want to move to the next topic. Huh? So the next topic I would like to talk about are essentially jets. Um, now jets, uh, oh, let me maybe add, uh, so jets. Uh, so why are jets so important or where do they enter jets? Uh, essentially they enter everything that you do at the LUC. Now suppose that you want to uh, do top reconstruction. The top decays, uh, it, it decays to be, so you're talking about P jets. So for things like uh, uh, mass reconstruction, top reconstruction, uh, if you want to look at Higgs uh, decays so on your physics searches, uh, you, you look at the decays that involve uh, B quarks, involve jets. You want to attribute a structure to the event, a structure to the event. Or you want to look at, uh, say, PDF fits. They enter when you do PDFs. In fact, they provide strong concern on gluon PDFs. And it also, in turn, enter any possible study that you do. Um, also, for instance, suppose that you want to look at, say, Higgs to WW. You'd say, well, this has nothing to do with jets. No, because unless you require a jet veto, in this channel, you would be dominated by TT bar uh, that goes to WW, BB bar. Uh. So here you have these additional jets. Uh, and so if you want to see Higgs, if you want to have any chance of uh, really seeing, studying this precisely, you have to require a jet veto. 
So that event does not have extra jets. So whether you want to study the jets or whether you want to look at jets, at the end you will see that everything you do at the LHC involves jets. Now the topic is rich because this, uh, what the jet algorithm does essentially is uh, to take the complicated kinematics uh, and project it out to, um, to somehow a simpler structure to an event that has two, three, four jets. But because this projection is ambiguous, it's really this ambiguity that makes it a very rich topic, right? And so the, the ambiguity has to do essentially with which particles should belong to a jet, how do you recombine particles into a jet, and so on. And uh, so what I'm showing here is uh, some of the timeline on different jet algorithms that were suggested in the past. So in the first lectures, uh, we talked about this thermal Weinberg jet diffusion. I hope you remember, it was this one with these two parameters, epsilon and delta and so on. And uh, later on, different algorithms were suggested, in particular, so-called cone type or KT-like algorithms. And I will uh, say in this lecture what they are. And really now, since about, I would say 15 years or so, this topic of jets and uh, not only of assigning to an event jet, but also looking inside the structure of the jet, the so-called jet substructure, really it has become a very, very active field and very, there's really a lot of development in this. So I would like to give a little bit an idea of what, uh, what the topic is about. So, so when you take uh, jet algorithms, uh, we have essentially two broad classes. We have two classes. One is so called cone type. And the other one is sequential. So the idea is really a little bit different. So cone type is a bit a top down approach. So you cluster together particles that are together in a coordinate space. So really in your detector, they will hit uh, parts of the detector are close to each other, right? So the idea is you put cones, the jets are cones along the direction where there is a lot of energy and momentum flowing. Sequential algorithms. So here, for instance, this KT algorithm or KT, the anti-KT, the so-called Cambridge Aachen algorithm. These are all sequential algorithms. And here the idea is that you cluster together particles that are close to each other in momentum space. So you define a distance between the momenta of the particles. And then you try to put a, So the idea here is that you try to undo the branchings that occurred in perturbative diffusion. So we learned that when uh, something branches, uh, these branches tend to be soft or collinear. So typically you try to reconstruct uh, this uh, soft and collinear branches to cluster together particles that are soft or that are collinear to somebody. Right. And of course, if you think about an algorithm and think about what are the good properties of uh, jet algorithms, uh, well, of course you want something that is uh, simple, transparent, easy to understand, but also very important that um, is infrared safe. So where well, you can make calculations to all others in perturbation theory. And if, instead, if you look at this um, algorithms, uh, we will discuss why, but some of these that were used also for a long time at the Teveton were in fact not infrared safe. So now let me start by giving you the definition or the explain how the um, inclusive KT algorithm, so the KT algorithm works. And I will write directly the definition as is uh, as applies to the LHC. And then I will explain a little bit how it was in plus and minus. But so the KT algorithm, so the inclusive, the inclusive. So what do you do? So you take, uh, all particles in the final state, all pairs of particles i and j, 
And then you compute this distance, uh, distance between i and g is equal to the distance in rapidity between these two particles. Uh, we discussed rapidity now in detail this morning, and the distance in phi between the particles. This is what the, <clears throat> this combination here is often called the delta r i j squared. You divide by a given radius. This is the example radius of your algorithm. And then you multiply by the minimum of kti squared ktj squared. Okay. And then you also define a distance of particle i with respect to the beam. We call it dib. And this distance is simply the transverse momentum of the particle squared. Okay. Then you find the smallest of these distances. So if the smallest is a dij, then you recombine these two particles together into a new particle. And here, in principle, one can use different recombination schemes. Now, the one that is always used is to simply sum the four vectors of the particle. So you build a somehow massive pseudo particle. If instead, the, so here you recombine, combine i, j. If the smallest is a d, i, b, then you declare this to be a jet. It will not recombine with anybody anymore. You remove it from the list of particles. So you declare. I eject and remove. So at every step, you remove one particle, alpha because we combine two together, or because you declared one to be eject. And then you iterate the procedure till you have no particles left in the event. Yeah. So this is the inclusive version of the KT algorithm. And of course, this can give a different number of jets in your final state when you run it like this, according to how many times you recombine and how many times you declare particles to be jets. Now, notice that this delta RIJ has um, sets essentially the minimal interjet angular distance between these two particles, between these two, between these two jets. Right. You can, of course, also define an exclusive version of this algorithm. So if you exclusive version, so you can define to stop, for instance, if dij or dib is larger than a cap that you introduce. Right? So you require this way stop at a given point or so this is one version that you can do. Or you can stop when you reach the injects. You can cluster up to when you reach the three jets or something like this. So these are the different versions of the inclusive KT algorithm in a, a Taylor collider. So now really, <coughs> the The original KT algorithm, let me just say, was really um, suggested for E plus E minus. And in E plus E minus, the distance that you have is typically called Y, Y i j. They are somehow, the, the beam has no, no impact there. It's not important. What, what is uh, the relevant value that enters are the energies of the particle. So it's defined as the minimum of E i e j squared. One minus cos of theta i j squared. This was uh, so you had no distance with the beam uh, in e plus e minus. You compute these distances and you always cluster together those that are closer, always clustering. And then again, you can decide to stop at a given when you reach a given y cut, or you can uh, define, decide to stop when you reach n jets and so on. <clears throat> The thing I would like to say, so in fact, this definition has a two here in front, uh, that um, this uh, somehow, the reason this was suggested in this form or the, um, is that this satisfies the requirement then 
when, em when an emission is very soft, or when two emissions are convenient to each other, they are, these emissions are clustered together. And in particular, they are clustered early on in the clustering, right? So the idea was really to undo the branching set of here that we this QCD. So this essentially this YIJ, YIJ goes to zero when you have, uh, when this uh, theta IJ goes to zero, because it's, uh, or when uh, EI or IJ go to zero, right? So you cluster, you tend to cluster soft emission right away early on uh, and so on. And uh, so the way this was suggested is that uh, it respects the structure of the QCD singularities, you can compute it in perturbation theories to all others. <clears throat> now, it, uh, going back to Hadron colliders, uh, there are two variants of the KT algorithms that I really use quite a lot in experimenting experimental studies that I would like to discuss a second. One is the Cambridge Aachen. Cambridge Aachen algorithm. So the, the algorithm is the same. The only thing that changes is the other distances. The Cambridge Aachen one, the distance is this find the cis delta R i j squared divided by R squared. And the distance with respect to the beam is set to one. So the Cambridge Aachen algorithm is essentially a pure geometrical algorithm. That's why this is used a lot because to some extent it's a closer to cone type algorithms. And the other one that instead is used a lot is the so-called anti-KT algorithm. Probably many of you have heard of them because this uh, anti KT is now the default algorithm in uh, many studies. Here, the distance is defined in this way D i j, you take the minimum of one over k t i squared, one over k t j squared, and then you have still this delta r j squared over r squared, and the D i b is defined as one over kti squared. So somehow it is, it does the opposite of the normal kt algorithm. So soft emissions are clustered only at the very end. And the effect of this is that you don't, so the disadvantage of the kt algorithm is that by clustering all the soft emission early on and putting them all in the jet, you would have very large jets within a very extended area. And this is something that the experimental studies is not so nice to have. The Cambridge Aachen jet shapes are really more circular, more acid. And also the anti-KT ones have this kind of much more geometric and nice shape. Okay, so as I said, I mean, when you cluster, there are ambiguities in how you perform the clustering, but, now, I mean, uh, the standard thing that is done and what is also used for uh, all the jet substructure, substructure studies is to simply recombine, add together for momenta. By that, you get massive, uh, massive pseudo particles uh, at the intermediate stages. But this somehow is what you want to have if, if you're trying to do a mass reconstruction. So, for instance, if you have a Higgs that decays to BB bar and you at the two moments of the big works together, you will reconstruct the mass of the Higgs boson, which is really what you want to have, uh, what you want to do in my studies. So this is how these uh, sequential algorithms work. work. Now I would like to say a few words about cone algorithms instead. Uh, and what is the problem with cones? What is the problem with infrared safety? Of uh, Julia, uh, yes, sorry, yes. there is a question. Uh, oh, uh, thank you. I, yeah, I don't. See the chart where is it? Mm -hmm. So yes, um, can you scroll up again a little bit? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you mentioned it. So the the R and denominator is the jet radius, right? Exactly. R is the jet radius. And uh, what are usually typically values for it if we want to compute it, the distance? What are good values you ask? Oh yeah, what typically values are used? 
you know, so I should have said it. So R really gives you the size of these jets. You see that if you take a larger R, you will get larger and larger jets. Values set I use vary between, I would say, 0.4, 0.7, or 1. One is already a very large jet, and one we will see later, hopefully, is useful and is used when you want to first collect a lot and then look at the substructure inside. Then you typically do a declustering and then you use a bit smaller radius. But somehow, I mean, we saw today you know, that uh, we looked a little bit at how the rapidity translates into, a, into distances in detectors and so on. So you see that uh, R equal one, uh, if you think about it as a distance in rapidity, is already really a large uh, region, right? Uh, and uh, in some studies, you find R equal 0.1, 0.2, but this is very, very rare. So typical values default uh, 0.4, 0.7, usually, in R plus CMS. Okay, thanks. Yeah, maybe I can see if there are other questions. No. Okay, so let me set, say how how do cone algorithms work? Huh? So cone. What you can do when you want to define a cone algorithm is that you say a particle i at a given that has a given uh, rapidity y i and uh, angular phi i, you say belongs is inside the cone c if and only if if and only if so like this you say if y i minus y cone squared minus so the, this, the difference squared, somehow this uh, delta r squared of the particle with respect to the center of the corner is smaller or equal to the radius of the corner. No? It's very intuitive. So you use you, in your y phi plane, you have a possible center of a cone here, yc. And then you say, well, particles belong to this cone if and only if they are in this region here. Right. Very intuitive. Right. However, how do you build, how do you find this, uh, the positions of these possible cones and so on? So what you can do is you can start by putting some trial directions and then you can see if particles are in or not in the cone. For instance, uh, you can put the particle here, and then you see that. Uh, so let me try to. You can try to see if uh, some particles are inside this cone, and you find, well, yeah, these ones are. But then you see that uh, your jet is not really, this is not really the center of uh, the jet. So when you find that the particle is inside, at the end, you, you recompute the center of your cone. Huh? And you compute it till essentially the center lies, uh, lies in this case here, where your emissions actually are. You would say, this is now my corner, right? And this is now my, sorry, I didn't draw it very nicely. But, uh, so in essence, you redefine, uh, you redefine a new average, uh, new position for your cone by taking uh, the rapidities of the particles that are in the corner. Maybe weighted by the PPs, PP pi. The same you compute for possible phi, sum over the i that are in the cone, i in cone, phi i weighted by the PT. So somehow you do give more weight to some of the PPI. And when at the end this uh, weighted average and the geometrical average coincide, then you say I have found a stable cone, and this is now a jet. It's a candidate jet. Right. So one issue that you can have is that when you do this, uh, jets can overlap. So concretely, you can uh, 
you can have some emissions here. And you can say, well, this is a jet. Some emissions here. And then you can have some other emissions here. And this is another jet. So when you do this procedure, jets can overlap. So what you have to do in this cone algorithm is that you run what you call a split merge. Split merge procedure. So you introduce a parameter f and say, if the jets share an energy fraction that is larger than this value f, then I merge the two jets and I say, this is just one big jet, right? You can merge it. Or if the energy fraction shared is only very little, then you say, well, these are really two jets. And then you have to, you can decide to, how to assign the emissions that overlap to one of, you assign them then only to one of the two jets. For instance, the ones where they are closer to in uh, this distance, uh, this uh, delta distance. Right? But in essence, a cone algorithm, you see, have two parameters, the radius of the cone, the radius, and this split merge algorithm, this split merge parameter f. Now, again, if we talk about the values, the recommendation is not to use a, a, an f that is larger than 0.5. Right? Otherwise, if you take an f that Sorry, not to take an F that is too small, but because if you take an F too small, you would create really very big uh, jets, right? You would uh, merge too much. Right? Okay, so now what is the issue of uh, infrared safety when you have cones? So here, when I discussed this, I was already a little bit uh, vague because I did not tell you how do you start? How do you start maybe seeing if uh, there is a candidate jet. So this, uh, the positions where you try to see if there is a jet, uh, if there could be a stable cone, uh, is what you call seeds. Uh. And these seeds, the presence of seeds, is what makes this cone algorithm infinite and safe. Um, so how does one see this? Uh, let me maybe explain this in an example. So, Suppose that we have an event that looks like this. Now, I mean, to simplify, let me only show the PT, for instance, and um, the angle phi or the rapidity here, it doesn't matter, phi or y, it doesn't matter. Or, the, or you could think that this is the delta R directly. Okay. Now, suppose that my event has looks like this. I have one emission here, have another emission say here, and then I have another emission here. Okay. So typically what one does is one tries to put, uh, one tries to use as a seat the position where you have emissions. Right. So in this case, you would try to put the cone around here, so around uh, here, you could try to put a cone here or around here, right? And then, for instance, you might see that then you see that if you put the cone here, a radius here, you see that both emissions here are and here, then you move your cone a little bit and you, you find at the end, let me maybe mark it like this, you find a stable cone here. I don't know how to mark it, maybe like this. You find that this is a stable cone, and you find here another stable cone. So you find that you have uh, two possible, two jets, two stable cones. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the problem? The problem is that if I now add a little emission here, I will also try to put a stable cone here or I could try to put a cone here, and I actually can find a cone, an extra cone here, that contains these two emissions. Okay. So if I have, or if I don't have an extra soft emission, the soft emission creates an extra seed, 
And so this uh, can give rise to an extra possible candidate jet. So in this particular example, you see that uh, here I had a cone. So let me give uh, labels to this particle P1, this is say P2, P3, and this is my P soft. So in this case, this contains P1 plus P2, this contains P3, and this contains P2 plus P3 plus the soft emission in this case. So you see these cones overlap, huh? and I have then to run a split merge procedure. I might decide to merge them or split them and so on. So at the end, what happens depends a bit on the details of your algorithm. But the infrared safety is the fact that when you add a soft emission, you try an extra, you have an extra seed, and so you get uh, um, you can get extra stable cones. So it's really seeds. Huh? So it is the presence of seeds uh, that, uh, that make uh, cone algorithms unsafe. Uh, unsafe. So if you would not have seeds, uh, you would have no problem with that. Uh, if you essentially try all possible combinations of uh, different particles uh, who can belong to the cone. If you try all combinations, you have no issues uh, with infrared safety of cone algorithms. And in fact, this was realized uh, long time ago. And uh, so for instance, uh, in, uh, So somehow said that the solution to this was to um, essentially try all possible combination of particles and see if those are stable cones. Huh? So you never miss them. If you try all possible combinations of particles, by definition, you will never miss any combination. So you never miss a possible stable cone. Huh? What is the problem of this? So essentially try all combinations, try all combinations. The problem is that if you have n particles and you count how many combinations you have, the combinations are n like 2 to the n. Okay. So if you have 100 particles, which is very well realistic to really see, you get a clustering time that scales as 10 to the 17 years. So it's a really, you get plus and times that are comparable to the age of the universe. So completely prohibitive. So this cannot be done. You can do it in perturbative calculations. So we have seen that when you do perturbative calculations, you have two, three, four, five particles, and that's it. So there you can use something like that. But in anything that is more realistic with a large multiplicity, you can actually not really use it. So the solution to this came then in by Soyer and Salam in 2007. And they suggested what is called CISCON. That uh, I forgot now what the exactly means, but CISCON means a seedless, uh, a seedless infrared safe cone algorithm. And what uh, essentially the observation was uh, that uh, if you have an event, uh, now here I'm uh, again writing these distances. So this is uh, the y plane and this is the phi plane. Yeah? And you have emissions here. These are now possible emissions in this plane. If you want to find, uh, so let me, sorry, let me show for instance, here you could have many, here you could have another jet where you have many emissions and so on. It makes no sense uh, to try combinations, for instance, where mm -hmm. I don't know, this particle is in a jet and this particle in a jet, but this one is not. It obviously makes no sense. So what they suggested is that you could uh, turn this into a computational ge geometry problem where you take enclosures in two dimensions and move them around this plane and only look at, try to take combinations only for particles that actually are close to each other. So really only try to move circles uh, around the plane, move it around. 
And then they found that uh, they could uh, suggest an algorithm that, uh, in fact, uh, has a, a clustering time that is uh, very manageable. No? So somehow n squared terms of the n. So not uh, 2 to some power n, right? Um, so like that, by trying all possible con combinations that are actually sensible, uh, they don't miss stable cones. Uh, so the algorithm is completely flat safe. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, but uh, the cluster in time is really kept to a manageable level. I don't know if this uh, issue, I, I think I would like, uh, I hope you could understand what the problem is. And uh, if not, uh, maybe it's uh, if there are questions so far. Eh? No. OK. So maybe now I only want to show you a little bit. So what you can do, I mean, so there are many applications of what you can do now once you have these infrared safe algorithms. And one has to do with, for instance, defining the area of jets. And this is somehow, this is illustrated in this histogram here. Now, let me tell you how you define the area of jets. So, what you can do is you can take an event, huh? like the ones displayed here, and then uh, you can fill it with uh, a large number of, uh, so if you want a little grid of a very, very soft emissions. By very soft, I mean really orders of magnitude softer than anything else that you have. So these soft emissions, because they are so soft, they will not change the structure of the jets. And this is the definition of different safety. But because you can fill the whole plane, huh? you can see which emissions are clustered in which jet, right? So you can define the area of a jet in this way. And this is somehow shown here, right? So you see, you have uh, regions that don't belong to any jet, but you have other things where you really can uh, classify this area. So the nice thing that you can see here is, for instance, this is now the CISCON algorithm. And you see this really nice, uh, relatively circular cones here. Even more circular is really the anti-KT, has these really very nice circular shapes here. And you also see somehow, maybe you see it here now, the problem of the KT algorithm is that because it starts clustering the soft emissions wherever they are, they get clustered, they tend to be clustered together, you get these jets that have these very regular shapes. So for many studies, in particular searches for new physics, people don't really use the KT algorithm. They either use CISCON, um, Cambridge Aachen, or anti-KT. Okay. Another thing that you can do, which I hope I have here, yeah, is uh, once you define the concept of area of a jet, uh, one of the issues that we have at the LSC is so-called pile-up. So pile up is the fact that when you collide, uh, at LC, you collide really bunches of particles. And typically, so what you're interested are in this uh, very hard collisions or hard events. But together with these hard events, there are a lot of soft interactions that also somehow pile up there and give rise to soft radiation. Okay. So, what you can do then, if you have a concept of area of a jet, is that you can define this area to define an um, area-based pile-up subtraction, right? So essentially, if you want to reconstruct the mass of a, say, a Z-prime, in this example, a Z-prime of 2 TV, you would look at the invariant mass of the jet. But this invariant mass gets a contamination from this pile-up, and you want to find a way to subtract it. So what you can do, is typically in your event when you have pile up, you have two hard jets, which are somehow here, these ones huh, that you're really interested in, huh? this and this. And there are these uh, many, many soft jets. Huh? So what you do is you define an. Uh, you define somehow kind of a density, PT of the jets huh, divided by the area of the jet. Huh? for all, uh, all jets that you have. Huh? And then you can define a subtraction, PT jet subtracted, huh? which is the original momentum of the jet, huh? minus 
this density that you have times the area of your jet. So essentially, you have to think like this, all these areas are filled by this soft, uh, soft radiation. And you subtract something that is proportional, event by event, you compute what is the average there, you subtract it and so on. And the effect is shown here in this plot. So you see that, for instance, if you have pile up and you don't subtract it, you get this blue curve. So not only this thing is completely diluted, very washed out, but even the position of the peak has nothing to do with your 2 GV resonance because you added a lot of stuff to your jet. When you do subtraction, you get back to this black curve here. So you see that the position of the peak now nicely is aligned with 2 GV. Of course, if you don't have any pile up, huh? and to do a subtraction, you have a very little shift, but you see the effect is really very small. You also see that if you don't have pile up, your peak is much nicer, it's much more narrow, but this is how it is at the LHC. There's not much you can do about that. And similarly, again, if you want to do mass reconstruction, one of the important things is the somehow, so the jet algorithm is better, the more narrow the window is where you have uh, um, a fraction f of your generated uh, events. So in essence, in algorithms where you reconstruct the mass very nicely, but uh, it's a kind of washed out and larger, it's less efficient or you need a higher luminosity to really establish that there is a massive object here. Right? And so this uh, can be then translated. So what people do or did uh, and so on extensively is to take different algorithms and then uh, look at, for instance, uh, suppose that you're looking at uh, these plots here. Suppose that you're looking at the Higgs mass of 100 GV, which one is the algorithm of the different one that we discuss, a KT, anti-KT, uh, Cisco, this subject, we didn't discuss it, but okay, it doesn't matter. But you can really see which one is better for this study, not only which algorithm is better, but what is the radius that is most suitable for what you want to see. So for instance, in this case here, you would see that alpha D, so these are somehow really optimal choices. So the smaller this window is, the better, because it means everything is in a small mass window. Now you can also see that if you would take this and then go to a height, much higher mass, Higgs, you would be sitting here, and this is far away from your optimal point. So this really relates to this question that there was about uh, what is a good value of R. So for these studies here, something like a larger radius when you have a more massive object is in fact better than a smaller. But this really depends on, uh, on the specific physics study that you want to do. Okay. So this is somehow in terms of uh, just clustering. Now, yeah, what I want to discuss a little bit, maybe I seem to discuss it starting from this slide, is this, uh, I, mean, uh, I mentioned that the jet substructure became essentially a whole new field on its own. Uh, and I want to discuss how this field uh, kind of started. Okay. And so it, started, if you want, by trying to, um, to look at Higgs to be bar in associated Higgs production. Right? So this channel was essentially believed to be impossible. This is the statement that you find here in the old Atlas CBR. You can find this statement that the extraction of a signal from Higgs to BB in the WH channel will be difficult even under the most optimistic assumptions. And why is that? Well, it's in the matter of cross section. So this is somehow you, you can see it in this plot. You are completely overwhelmed by other backgrounds. So this is a very small signal. And you know that you have statistical fluctuations, systematics, and so on. So people believe that this is simply not possible, simply because you have 
Titi Barra, or a w, WJJ, WD Barra production that somehow has a very large cross section, and there is no way you they thought that you can extract something like this tiny signal here. Right? And then uh, this is somehow where instead then uh, some ingenuity came uh, to help. And so, what did people uh, think? I mean, uh, the, the idea was to look at this. Uh, Associated Higgs production. Sorry, I lost my name. In the region where the, the Higgs is highly boosted. So typically, if uh, if the Higgs is almost at rest, if this is what you're looking at, uh, so W. W Higgs, if this Higgs is at low momentum, the bees will go somewhere here, right? Somewhere in the, in the event and so on. But if instead you require a high boost for the Higgs boson, so if you require that your event looks, this is really a high PT Higgs, recoiling against the boson, then the BB bar will tend to be close to each other because this, they will tend to follow the highly boosted Higgs boson, right? So what did people then suggest? How can one see this? They suggested first, so step one, find the clustering using a large, a relatively large Cambridge Aachen, Cambridge Aachen algorithm with somehow a large R, large R of the order of one, right? So here the idea was really to, how should I draw this? So you have your Higgs, the Higgs decays to be, BB bar, there can be radiation, we know that there can be extra radiation. This is my B, my BB bar. Bar, and there can be gluons, and there is all the underlying event here that fits in this. Huh? But I try to catch all of them in the same jet, all of these. Right, huh? Then you do, and this is the first time when you use this uh, jet substructure, you, um, you uncluster, so you undo the last recombination, so you build essentially two smaller jets here. So you undo the last combination and have now two smaller jets. And require that somehow there is a large mass stroke. So this large jet, the blue one, will typically have the mass of this jet will typically be close to the mass of the Higgs boson. But the mass of the light jets should be Closer to should be very light. These are big works, so the mass of a B is 5 GV. So these are light masses. So you require that the ratio of the mass of the subjects to the big jet is uh, there's a large mass drop. Then you require that these two jets should be relatively symmetric. Right? And this is because the Higgs to BB bar splitting, you know that this is symmetric. So you require that these two objects are relatively symmetric. You require a bit take, so each of them should contain a big work. And then you do, you say you kind of filter, you want to filter away on all, all, all this contamination, underlying event contamination, whatever here. This is all the soft radiation that enter. To filter it away, again, you take only the three hardest subjects that you have in this big jet. So the three, so you try to catch effects of perturbative QCD but to filter away all the underlying uh, other stuff that is there. And if you do this, uh, this is uh, what came out of this first study. This is about, uh, this was suggested in about 2008. Uh, 2008. Uh. So here they showed essentially that if you look at this in this way, you have one peak, uh, that is, uh, has to do really, this is the Z boson peak. Uh, and this, uh, you, 
it's nice to have. It also tells you that you have calibrated things nicely, if this at the right position. And then here they said, so here they were assuming that the Higgs boson is 115, and they saw this kind of nice peak. So they, they saw, they showed explicitly how you can uh, get the signal out. Uh, so by doing this procedure that I described here, you essentially get rid of uh, a large part of uh, all the QCD backgrounds, right? because you really tune your algorithm to what you really want to find. In this case, the Higgs boson going to be the bar. They knew, I mean, you have, so this works particularly nicely if you really know what you're looking for, of course. If you tune what you're looking for to what, um, Sorry, I'm getting tired. If you tune your algorithm to what you want to find, then you can really enhance the signal to background, the ratio of signal to square root background. So in, in that case, uh, they, they were even too optimistic. They somehow said that this can become a discovery channel. This was not a discovery channel, you know, very well, but it was seen relatively soon afterwards. So they were at the end not so... Also, also, and okay, I mean, this is somehow what I mentioned here is the first example of one can do in terms of um, looking inside, so reconstructing with a large R, looking inside the jets, and so on. Now, this, as I said, this really became a whole field uh, by itself, essentially. In um, there are sophisticated techniques uh, called the grooming, trimming, and so on, that clean up uh, somehow have this effect of removing the underlying event contamination and so on. And they really enter a lot of the studies that are being done today at LHC. When you look, uh, when you try to find the resonance that decays um, to quarks or to gluons, there are also a lot of uh, studies have to do with quark gluon jet discrimination. We know, I mean, <clears throat> We know that the quark jet is typically tends to be uh, more narrow and somehow contains less radiation than the gluon jet just because of this property of CF equal to four over three, CA equal three. And so a lot of things, a lot of studies uh, being carried out. So this is really now a whole uh, new field. Okay. So I think this is all I wanted to say about jets. Huh? So, to recap, I mean, we have a small summary. We have seen that there are these two really big main classes, sequential type, uh, KT or Kenway-Jachen, and cone types. Cone types originally had this issue of infrared safety. Now there is this cone that is an infrared safe cone algorithm. And th this is used at the LHC, but those that are really more used are IFA, Kenway-Jachen or anti-KT. The end because they have this kind of uh, um, regular, nicely shaped jets. At the end. So the other thing we have seen is when we talk about jets, it's not enough to say this is anti-KT. It really matters if it's anti-KT with a given radius. And by playing with this uh, value of the jet radius, you can uh, enhance uh, your sensitivity. Or, this you can uh, at the end really translate it to effective luminosity that you gain by having a jet algorithm that works uh, better for a particular study. And um, what else have we seen? Uh, yeah, how you can use this to do this area based subtraction, uh, how you can define these quality measures, uh, and uh, the, the issue of uh, jet substructure. Wanted to say something else that I have forgotten now. In, uh... oh, I forgot. So maybe we see if there are questions so far up to, up to now. If not, I want to say very few extra words on parton showers as well. Huh? Because, okay, I, I don't have time anymore to cover it as a big topic, but at least I want to say a few words on that. Huh? But maybe <clears throat> let's see if there are questions so far. Huh? No, I hope that everything is clear. And, uh, okay, so let me now move uh, to topic of pattern showers. So what? So when we talk to today, this earlier today about perturbative calculations, uh, I always told you that uh, okay. We can compute things according to the order at which you do calculations. We can compute things with uh, 
six, maybe eight particles, or if you do a high order calculation, uh, three, four particles, or maybe only two in the final step. Now, LFC events are really very, very different. They really typically, so this is a sketch of what you can have uh, in your mind when you think about an LFC event. So on one side, you have a lot of radiation from initial state or from the final state, but also typically you have hadronization effects. So what you see in detectors at the LFC are a huge number of uh, pions, maybe photons, uh, and so on, right? uh, some other hadrons. Now, the fact that perturbative calculations work well uh, is based on this, what I already mentioned before, this uh, uh, parton hadron duality. So the hard scattering here, so in this example that I'm showing here, is this TT bar cross section. This is really <clears throat> happens at very high energy scale. And hadronization instead happens at a much lower energy scale. So that if you want the time scales are related to time is one over energy. So the time scales of these processes are very different. So they don't interfere very much. So we say that hadronization does not affect or also all these extra soft, low energy soft emissions don't affect the perturbative cross sections very much. And this is why perturbative calculations work. Still, experimentalists like to have tools that are that really give a full exclusive description of the final state in terms of these hadrons and pions. And these are, in fact, implemented in what are called parton showers. Now, so parton showers, um, yeah, okay. I don't, I think I don't have enough time to enter too much into details. So how should I explain it in a few words? So pattern showers essentially rely on taking this soft approximation that we saw before in a... So we saw that when you take a pattern, sorry. So that when you have a part on that, there is an approximation that is very useful, the soft and collinear approximation. And in that approximation, you can um, approximation, you can essentially compute radiation as if the radiation emitted has no little effect on the hard part. So you can essentially write uh, or you okay. Maybe what I should say is that what you do is you, let me write it in this form. What you do is you take a cross section for n plus one particles. You write a cross section where you have the lower multiplicity. And then you integrate over this variation, over these radiation variables. So here, when you emit one particle, you have three variables, radiation variables which uh, let me call this schematically in this form, the T over T, this can be a virtuality, can be an angle, can be an energy, energy fraction Z, alpha S over two pi and the splitting function here. So what you do, what you can do is you can uh, think of uh, that uh, something that evolves uh, from one scale to a different scale, T1, evolves on a different scale. And when it evolves, it can alpha split or not split. Right. So you, the emission, so you relate the one who an emission probability. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm explaining this in a very bad way because I don't have time to get into the details. But uh, maybe I should simply say, so this quantity, is related to the probability to emit one gluon. In the picture where all emissions factorize and so on, you can somehow exponentiate this and be what is called the pseudo form factor. That is the exponent of, of minus this one gluon emission probability between two scales. So this then, in this part of our picture, can be written somehow in this form, kt squared over kt squared, then the integral of the splitting function, this is related to the, so the pseudo-coform factor, 
is a fundamental point that you take in this Monte Carlo. And this related to evolve from one scale at Q0 to another scale without any splitting. So in essence, the way Monte Carlo's work is that you generate random numbers and you decide whether to split or not to split based on the pseudo-conform factor. And so you generate um, in a probabilistic way radiations following an order where you somehow go, you have an ordering variable, you follow this ordering and at any step you decide whether you emit or not. And so by doing this, you generate many emissions, but you generate them in this somehow approximation, this somehow soft and collinear approximation, essentially following the splitting functions only. So you somehow move down and this, uh, follow this evolution, and then you stop when you somehow have reached a very low virtuality. And by doing this uh, at each step, each new emission can generate a new pattern shower from there. So it's a source of new branchings and so on. And what you do at the end is to generate a lot of emissions in a probabilistic way, where the probability follows this uh, approximation of QCD in the soft and collinear limits. So at the end, uh, you, you generate many emissions in this approximation. You don't have a somehow, you cannot claim a formal accuracy in that. This is some of the point I want to make. So pattern showers are useful tools because they, you can generate many emissions, but you don't have any formal accuracy. Now these tools, however, have been developed many, many years ago. The first pattern showers are from the 80s, 90s and so on. So of course, people put a lot of efforts in somehow improving on this description. And there are many effects, physical effects, that are actually implemented in pattern showers. So even if uh, naively they don't have a high accuracy at all, at the end, uh, they, on one side, they are tuned to reproduce data. They have been tuned a lot, for instance, to reproduce lab data and now also at the LFC. And on the other hand, there are a lot of uh, physical effects uh, that are formally beyond the accuracy that are implemented in. Uh, for instance, the effect of coherence. Um, coherence is a simple effect that says that uh, even in QAD, if you have uh, essentially in the plus and minus pair, sorry, I'm getting so minus the plus pair. Right. Uh, so this can. This can emit a photon, right? But when, uh, when the plus and minus pair is very collinear to each other, the radiation of a photon from this at large angle is suppressed. And these kind of effects in QCD take the name of coherence and are essentially implemented in Monte Carlo. So, so the bottom line is that, uh, in essence, Monte Carlo's uh, follow this equation are based on this, are based on soft collinear approximation. So by, by definition, Monte Carlo, if you take them as they are, they will never reproduce very nicely cross sections that involve, for instance, hard, large PT jets, because they're based intrinsically on the soft collinear approximation, or they are sort of, a, we say leading log accurate because they, for each gluon emission, they rely on the soft and collinear approximation. But at the end, what happens is that they work much better. They are in fact used in a lot of uh, LFC analysis. And now a lot of work is devoted to essentially combining these pattern showers. This is also something I really work on, is how do you combine pattern showers that rely on this um, all order approximation to really perturbative calculations uh, now next to next to leading order, for instance, uh, predictions. At the end, of course, what you want to have is something uh, that has this nice uh, description as written down here, but where you actually also have uh, the, uh, in the case, uh, for instance, something like this, TT bar, where you also have the two loop effects uh, or the, so the full next to next to leading order implementing. So these are somehow, Again, I think that people are working on the now. And at the end, if you have something like this, you, of course, have the best of the two worlds. You have, uh, when you look at inclusive cross sections, you have small uncertainties and so on. But then, uh, if you look at the full exclusive event, you also have the full exclusive description. 
So I'm sorry, I, I think I didn't have time to really cover in detail how these part of showers work. So maybe my discussion at the end was completely unorganized and not understandable. I wanted, but I wanted to say at least something before finishing, because I think this, uh, these tools, uh, Pitya, Herwig, and the others, are used uh, in uh, so many studies that I thought I have to say at least two words. And I think the message I think I would like you to remember is that pattern showers rely on the soft collinear approximation to generate many multiple radiation. And so they essentially generate following some order and they stop, they have even cutoffs in the internal cutoffs that we all have. But uh, at the end, they work very well. And what is being done today is try to work. Uh, well. So merging next to leading order and pardon shower was done many years ago. And a lot of work is done now in uh, putting together consistently next to next to leading order and pardon shower. And one might wonder, why is this so difficult? Well, it is difficult in essence because in a next to next to leading order calculation, you have uh, this type of emissions as well. But this you also have from the parton shower. And uh, if you simply combine this naively, you would have a problem of double counting, essentially. And it's very it's tricky not to, to avoid this. So sorry, I think the last part was a bit confused. <laughs> but let's see if there are questions. If not, then we have the discussion session tomorrow. I don't see where the chat is. Yeah, yeah I don't see questions. Uh, um, okay. Yeah, but yeah, as you say, there will be a, the, some discussion session as well. Um, and okay. then also Slack, so I would invite uh, uh, people posting questions in, uh, in Slack, in our Slack channel. Okay, okay. Um, there was, I saw that there was a question regarding this scheme definition of uh, uh, how to prove that these two coefficients are scheme independent. And maybe I have two minutes and I sketch the, the beginning of how one proves this, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know who asked it, I forgot who asked the question. But, so the statement was uh, that I asked you to prove uh, was that the first two coefficients of the beta function are scheme independent. Uh, now, I, let me not do the whole proof, but uh, let me tell you how one starts, and then maybe we can finish it tomorrow. So the way one starts is the following. One says, well, I have a schema, and I call alpha in the scheme, I call alpha S A. And I have alpha s in a different scheme. And I know that this, uh, they have to be the same at lowest order in perturbation theory, and they have to be related by a finite change. So by this, I mean that alpha s in scheme A can be related to alpha s in scheme B by a relation like this, uh, plus uh, higher order terms in alpha. Okay. And then, uh, I can take my beta function and say, what is the beta function in scheme A? Well, this is nothing but the, the derivative of alpha s in scheme A with respect to the scale. And by definition, this is what I call B0 in scheme A, alpha s in scheme A squared, minus B1 in scheme A, alpha s in scheme A cubed, plus higher order terms, OK? And now what I can do is uh, I simply take this relation. So this is by definition of what B0 and B1 are. But now I can essentially apply this derivative. Uh, so this one, this, uh, this derivative here. Now I apply to this side of the equation, right? Uh, I apply it to here. Then I will get terms that contain the derivative of alpha s in scheme B. So these are related to the coefficients B0 in scheme B and B1 in scheme B. And then, uh, so, I will, so I don't do it now, but if needed, then we can do it tomorrow. So you, you get something that uh, contains, uh, uh, B, involves B0 in scheme B, B1 in scheme B, and alpha s in scheme B. 
And then all you have to do is change back from alpha S in scheme B, change it back to alpha S in scheme A, and then you can equate what you get, you can compare to this equation here. So you will see that once you translate alpha S in scheme B back to alpha S in scheme A, and this you do by using this relation, and you can do it all less here. You have to think that when you expand, you have to always expand here and keep only the terms that are relevant. So the translation of alpha S in scheme B to alpha S in scheme A is simply one minus, sorry, let me write it, this is, let me write it here. Alpha S in scheme B is simply alpha S in scheme A, one minus C times alpha S in scheme A plus terms at a higher order. Okay. Then you will see that essentially this coefficient cancels out and you get that the, the terms are exactly the same. Huh? So maybe whoever asked the question can try to follow this huh? and see if it works out and otherwise maybe we can look at this tomorrow.